Jesus loves even me. What an amazing thought that is. <clears throat> I am so glad that our Father in Heaven tells of His love in the book He's given. Number 357. singing wasn't put that way but anyway um, I've been giving him the option so uh, but he's kind of been helping in other areas and with COVID we kind of decided that it'd probably be better for just one of us to be up here and of course I had been using the canned music but after the debacle last Sunday I decided not to try that anymore and uh, so anyway but uh, one of these days, I'll, get, I'll convince him to get back here, uh, I think. <laughs> but anyway, um, so just to let you know on that. Revelation chapter 1. Hopefully, we'll finally finish up this section. I thought about it this week. You know, if we keep going at this pace, we're definitely going to be in Revelation when the Lord comes back. <laughs> uh, so I don't know I'm, I'm trying to decide exactly what I can do to speed up but um, anyway I am certainly getting an awful lot of um, enjoyment out of the study so I hope you are too Revelation chapter 1 we'll go ahead and read the whole section tonight verses 4 to 8 John to the seven churches which are in Asia Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, 
and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Father, what a picture we have here in this passage of your dear son who taught us to address you as our father. In the Lord's Prayer, what a wonderful concept it is that we can call you our Heavenly Father. And all that that means and all that 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 we can cherish because of that. That we can be sons of the living God. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful book that you've given to us. To help us to know you. To help us to know your plan for all ages. I pray your blessing upon me as I preach this message tonight. That I might do so clearly, with clarity and thoroughly to expound upon the truths that we have in this passage and help us all understand what we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we have a head knowledge of that. I'm sure each one in this room knows that. Lord, help us to have a heart knowledge that changes the way we act, knowing that Jesus Christ gave is all for us. That is love unparalleled. Love amazing. Love divine. So Lord, as we tread into these deep waters of blissful explanation of what Jesus Christ has done for us may we indeed stand in awe at the revelation of Jesus Christ tonight in Jesus name I pray amen and as I alluded to in my prayer in verse 1 as we already talked about this is the revelation of Jesus Christ no wonder that in this passage here we have a number of verses, and this, this chapter is going to go on to talk about Jesus Christ and help us to understand who he is and what he's done for us and our, what our response should be to that. As we talked about this morning, and just real briefly, um, again, just a quick reminder. In verse 4, the first part, we have the author. He identifies himself as John. That is John, the beloved disciple, the apostle John. Um, that one that leaned on Jesus' breast. He is the author. Then we have the audience. Next, to the seven churches, in it, which are in Asia. And we listed those. I'm not going to relist those now, but we'll, when we get to chapter 2, of course, we will be looking at individual letters to each one of these seven churches that are, is penned here at the beginning of this book. Then we have the address and the atmosphere, grace and peace, that blessing that is typical of most epistles, helps us understand that this is a letter to churches, just like Paul's letters were letters to churches. This book is a lot longer, it has a lot of differences, but it is still, and we need to understand, this is a letter to churches, to those that, that name the name of Christ. And so that's the address and atmosphere. And then, last of all, we have the Almighty, the triune God. And in the first part, or the, the end of verse 4, he talks about him which is and which was and which is to come. That's God the Father. Then, of course, this morning I spent the entire message talking about that next phrase. There in verse 4, uh, it says, And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Talking about the Holy Spirit. 
and we talked about that extensively this morning. So now we want to get into verse 5 and talk about God the Son. For the next ver four verses, that is exactly the topic. God the Son. He says that he pronounces this blessing of grace and peace from God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and then it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And he goes on to describe, pardon me, to describe a number of things about this person, Jesus Christ. We have, first of all, his description in verse 5, the first part. It says, it calls him the faithful witness. Now, before I get into that, let me say a couple of things. I've alluded, I think I alluded to this this morning, and I'm really debating on exactly how to do this. Um, I probably should have done this before now. At some point before we finish chapter one, I don't know if I'm going to do it next Sunday. Uh, with having Hannah Hart's uh, graduation next Sunday night won't be the best time to do it, so I may put it off another week. But I want to do an overview on the four views of interpretation of Revelation. Uh, now, there are many more than just four, but there are basically four views that ones that we would call fundamental hold to. Um, and there are good scholars on all four different views. Um, and I'm going to take some time. It's going to be a lot more academic, if you will, <laughs> to do that. But I think you need to understand what these different views are about how to interpret Revelation. Revelation is a very unique book to look at. And it has some really unique challenges to understand. It is, there's a lot of symbolism in it trying to decide what is symbolism and what is not, trying to decide what is talking about things that have already happened and things that are yet to come. Obviously, when John, when John wrote this book, everything was to come. But we're now over almost 2,000 years past that point. And a lot of things that John wrote about, the debate is, are they past or are they not? <laughs> And so um, I want to take a little bit of time and do that um, and, and help you understand those things. I also want you to understand another thing. And <clears throat> that again, I'm kind of getting a little bit aside here, but um, I really debated on whether to do this before I even got into the book. But I wanted to kind of dive into it. I wanted to kind of get into some of the meat of this first chapter and, and whet your appetite before I got so completely academic that I bored you to death. I don't think I'm going to bore you, but uh, I'll try not to. But I want you to understand one thing. A number of things, but uh, I want you to really clearly understand this. That many good men differ about the interpretation of the book of Revelation. And, you know, sometimes... And I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you my opinion, but I want you to understand that I understand that it's only my opinion, okay? And if you disagree with me, as long as you can back up what you say by good, solid, sound scripture, then I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you about it, okay? If you don't agree with how I come down on something, that's not going to hurt my feelings, <laughs> Again, as long as what you say you believe is in keeping with Scripture, I'll give you good. I'll give you my reasons for believing the way I believe it. Um, but let's understand as we get into this from the outset that there's going to be things we're going to get into that number one, I'm not going to be able to explain, and number two, might be different than the way you understand it, or might be different than the person next to you understands it. Um, I am by no means a scholar in the book of Revelation. Uh, I am learning as I'm going. 
I took a class called Daniel and Revelation where we talked about Daniel and Revelation and things to come. Um, and even that class barely scratched the surface. Um, the volumes, the, the thing, I, one thing that's really interested me as I've been studying it, uh, studying this, is that the volumes of writings about the book of Revelation, if you really knew how many that is, you would be overwhelmed. <laughs> The number of people throughout all of the ages that have written on this book. I don't think there's too many other passages in scripture that are more controversial, that have different views of it than the book of Revelation. And one thing Brother Nichols mentioned this morning as we were talking together after the service that he was spot on about. In fact, I read... I read about that this week as I was studying this topic. But keep in mind that in John's day, John told us that he was writing about things that were to come. And since John's day, and when we get into the, the, the seven churches, there are those that believe that the seven churches represent the ages, uh, different ages of church history. And of course, the last one being the age when Jesus Christ comes back again. There's one really huge problem with that. And that is that in the year 1800, or you pick the year, okay? I'm just pulling that out of my, my hat. But in the year 1800, the believers that looked at Revelation and believed that the revelation the churches were representing their the ages they all believed that they were in that last age 200 years ago <laughs> or whatever and i mean that goes all the way back to the first century point being until christ comes back and until we have full understanding in our glorified body I don't think any of us are going to fully understand this book. So please understand as I go through this that I am not in any way going to be able to thoroughly explain all that there is to find in the book of Revelation. Um, that said, I believe there's a lot to be found, uh, a lot of encouragement, a lot of uh, things to look forward to. And um, so that's why we're getting into it. So anyway, that was a complete si a side track, but anyway, something I did I had been wanting to mention to you. And like I said, I do want you to know that in the next couple of weeks, we're going to stop and look at the different ways of looking at this book of Revelation. Um, and I want to hopefully help you understand um, those different views and why people hold to them and the strengths and the weaknesses of each of them. Um, I, in preparation for this series, quite a while ago, I purchased, uh, I think, over half a dozen books on the book of Revelation. One of them was called The Four Views of Revelation, and I have found it uh, astoundingly helpful. And uh, it talks about those four views, and that's why I'll be, I'll be using that um, extensively. Uh, for that, that particular message. But anyway. Alright. We have here God the Son and the first thing we see is his description in 5a. It say, it, it, the first adjective that it uses for Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. The faithful witness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 Verse 13, Paul tells Timothy, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. The interesting, it's interesting to call Jesus Christ a faithful witness. What did he witness to? Let's have a little reaction here tonight. Interaction tonight. What do you think it is 
that Jesus Christ witnessed to? How is he a faithful witness? Yes. Faithful uh, witness of, regarding the redemption? Absolutely. And in fact, it's going to talk about that here specifically. Folks, this is what I want you to understand here. When we look at the Word of God in the year 2020, and as we look back at the word as it was written, we often forget how people at the time that this book was written, what they knew and what they understood and how they viewed what was being said. And specifically, the difference between how the Old Testament viewed God and how we view God now thanks to the coming of Jesus Christ because he witnessed and was the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Well, not all of them. There were some that go, you know, go to the end time, but he, he was the focus of the Old Testament. He was that promised Messiah. Think about the fact. And I, I have a number of points here these are not uh, points um, that are my own. This comes from uh, John Phillips' commentary, but I thought it was, uh, I, I love the way he, he talked about the things that Christ was a faithful witness to. And the first thing he mentions is the name of God. Think about the fact, folks, and I mentioned this in our, my prayer this, to this evening. We can call God our Heavenly Father. Old Testament believers did not call God Father. It was Yahweh. He was a fearful God. A judging God. And Christ came. And when he taught us to pray, what did he say? Pray ye our Father, which art in heaven. That's an entirely different picture of our, our God than the Old Testament had any understanding about. A father. A loving, kind, caring, providing person. And Jesus taught us he was a witness to the name of God, God as our father. He was a witness to the nature of sin. The nature of sin. Evil. The Old Testament uses approximately 15 different words to describe sin and wicked. They use sin and wickedness and iniquity. And there are like 15 different words in the Old Testament that, that describe sin. Failure to meet God's standard. <clears throat> but Jesus Christ put a whole new meaning on sin because it was sin that nailed him to the cross. Again, nobody in the Old Testament understood that, Jesus, that the Messiah was going to come. I shouldn't say nobody, some did. But very few in the Old Testament understood that the Messiah was going to come and be crucified for us. Jesus Christ witnessed, and by doing so, he witnessed to the very wickedness and evilness of sin. It was our sin that nailed him to that cross. It was our sin that caused the Roman soldiers to yield, wield that whip across his back and run furrows in the flesh of his back to plant the crown of thorns on his skull to cause blood to drip from his, his head and all the other horrible, awful things that was done to Jesus Christ. 
all because of your sin and my sin. Jesus Christ was a faithful witness to the nature of sin itself. Jesus Christ was a witness to the need for righteousness. The need for righteousness. The law showed us that we can't reach God in our actions. But Jesus Christ showed us that it's not our actions that keep us out of heaven. It's our attitude. In the Sermon on the Mount, over and over, he talks about, you have heard that it's been said, thou shalt not, but I say unto you. And he goes further. You heard you should not commit adultery, but I say, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery in his heart. And on and on and on and on, Jesus takes the law and takes it down where we live and shows us the true nature or the need, true need for righteousness because none of us can attain it. He was a faithful witness to the nearness of judgment. We love to talk about heaven. One of the reasons people love to go to Revelation is they love to dwell on the promise of eternal bliss that's promised to those that trust Christ. And it's a marvelous thing. It is indeed a marvelous thing. But do you know that Jesus Christ talked a whole lot more about hell than he talked about heaven? In fact, somebody did a study on the book of, on the book of Matthew. Matthew gives us more, uh, more of Jesus' actual words and teachings than any of the other Gospels. It's the most exhaustive of those teachings. And somebody did a study on it, and they said that it is a three-to-one ratio in Jesus' teachings about hell versus heaven. He talked about hell and judgment three times more than he talked about heaven. He was a faithful witness to the nearness of judgment. And folks, think about it. If Jesus said judgment was near, <laughs> how much nearer is it 2,000 years later? And then he was a faithful witness to the news of salvation. Jesus Christ himself was that Passover lamb that brought salvation. So Jesus Christ is first of all described as a faithful witness. Then it says he's the first begotten from the dead. The first begotten from the dead. Um, Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. This is a fascinating concept here, folks. Jesus Christ is called the first begotten from the dead. How, how is that? There were people in the Old Testament that through the miracle of the power of God were raised from the dead. A few, not many. But Jesus Christ was the only one that raised himself. And Paul, in the book of Acts, Acts 13, 33, in talking about Jesus, he said, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's a quote from Psalm 2. And Paul takes that quote from Psalm 2, which itself is a messianic psalm, and makes it clear that when God talks about begetting the Son, he's talking about the fact that he's being raised, he acquaints that with the resurrection. So Jesus Christ is the first begotten, 
He's the first one, the first resurrection from the dead. And it is in his resurrection that we have the promise of our own resurrection. What is not clear, Carol? What about the resurrection of Lazarus? That's what I'm saying. There were those that were raised from the dead before Christ did. Yeah. You're right. Okay? There were those in the Old Testament that were. Um, the, the, the girl that, that saw uh, that... Um, Oh, come on. <laughs> Elisha. I, I, I couldn't remember if it was Elijah or Elisha. And I knew I was, if I said one, I was going to be wrong. But the girl that she, he raised. There were others that were raised from the dead. You're right, Carol. And I appreciate you thinking that. I could see that. The brow furrowing there. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, 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 no. Then I'll know that. Then I'll, I'll it still won't hide it. But Jesus is the first one that raised himself. Okay. okay? Right, got it. All the rest were raised in the power of God by other humans who told them to be raised and God raised them. But none of that, those men had the power to do that resurrecting. Right. Only God himself could do that. So that's what it's talking about here. Does that make it a little clearer? Yeah. Okay. Please... You know, as I'm going through here, and I told you this morning, I want to start from time to time having some question and answer times because I'm sure that there's going to be things you have questions about. If you have questions, raise your hand. I'll, I'll call on you. Or I don't mind. I want this to be instructed, okay? So, the first begotten, it talks about his priority and his sovereignty. Of course, 1 Corinthians 15 that great chapter on the resurrection says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Jesus Christ, by raising from the dead, became the conqueror over death and over hell and over the grave. And praise God, we can say, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy victory? I'm sorry. O oh, grave, where is thy sting? You're right. You're, you're right. And that's, that's another point. Miss Jed just said the other people that did raise from the dead, they eventually died. Jesus Christ is the only one that has raised himself and is still alive today and will one day come again. All right. Good point, Miss Jet. Thank you for bringing that up. So he's a faithful witness. He's the first begotten from the dead, and then he's the foremost ruler of the earth. The, it, the foremost ruler of the earth. It says, and the prince of the king's of the earth. This is where again Christ is said to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In um, Proverbs 21, it says the King's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of as the rivers of water, He turneth it whithersoever He will. God is in control of the kings of the earth. Psalm chapter 2 again that messianic psalm that I just mentioned earlier says why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us he that setteth in the heavens shall laugh the Lord shall have them in derision can you imagine the futility of an earthly king raising his fist against God? And yet so many of them do. So that is his description. 
Then we have, in the last part of verse 5, in the first part, first part of verse 6, we have his deeds. It says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We have, first of all, his passionate love. He loved us. And again, <laughs> we could park here and talk for hours about the love of God and the love of Christ. As I mentioned earlier, as, we, as I was talking about down from his glory, the thought that Jesus Christ left heaven's glory to come to earth is a testimony to the love that he has for you and me. Yes, indeed, as we sang earlier, Jesus loves even me. As ugly as I am and as selfish as I am. Unless you smile at those things, you're just as ugly and just as selfish. And yet Jesus loved each one of us. <laughs> Amen. Jesus loves even me, as wicked as I am. Jesus loves us. His passionate love. Then his purifying blood. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It was required that sin be covered in the shedding of blood. The Old Testament required the, the regular sacrifices. And only Jesus Christ was able to shed his blood once for all. Absolutely. Hallelujah and amen. That is such a wonderful truth. That Jesus Christ shed his blood for us. His passionate love. His purifying blood. And then his promoting power. It says in verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. Over and over in, or several times in scripture. This concept is talked about. In Revelation 5.10, again, John says, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That is the promise to all of us as believers. And again, it's not because we deserve it. And of course, Peter said the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9 through 10. He says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And again, I, re I remind you folks that this is a concept that the Old Testament Jews and anyone else that trusted in Christ in the Old Testament had no concept of. That we can come to the very throne of grace on our own. What was the function of a priest to be a mediator between God and man. We don't need a priest anymore. Because God has made us our own priests. To come directly to God. And to make our petitions known. And to worship him directly. What a privilege. What an awesome privilege. That is. Please. Um, please. Don't take that for granted. That we can come before God. And we are made kings and priests. Those were the two ruling classes of the Old Testament. 
And God has made us, as believers, kings and priests. What a wonderful, wonderful concept that is. So his deeds, his passionate love, his purifying blood, and his promoting power. Then in verse, the last part of verse 6, we have his dominance. It says, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It said, uh, one commentator I read said that this is the first of seven doxologies that are forth told or, or proclaimed in the book of Revelation. There are seven. One verse six, four verse nine, four verse 11, five verse 12, five verse 13, seven verse 12, and 19 verse one. All are a doxology or a proclamation of the greatness of God. And this is the first and shortest. It says, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Why does it say that? Because of all the things it's just said. All these things that Jesus has done for us in our age, in our time. We are now priests and kings. We have this faithful witness of Christ who has shown us everything we need to know about how to live for God and how to please him. And one day we will be raised with him. His dominance. First of all, he's praiseworthy. It says glory. He's also powerful. Dominion. And he's perpetual forever and ever. Jesus Christ. There is no end. And then verse 7 talks about his dissension, his descension. It says in verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. One day Jesus Christ is going to come again. Now, We know that Jesus Christ has promised to come back. And this talks about him coming in the clouds. We had an awful lot of clouds recently. He's coming to church and some of those clouds looked awfully ominous over in the east. Every time I see a beautiful puffy cloud it makes me think I wonder if that's the kind of cloud Christ is going to come in. What a wonderful thought that is. That Christ is going to come again. And every eye shall see him. And notice it says, and they also which pierced him. That's interesting. Because the ones that pierced him aren't going to be living on earth when he comes back. But they're going to witness it. And it, the Bible does tell us that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, it's not, a, not everyone's going to see him in the rapture. No, not in the rapture. No, but it has to be the second when is the great, 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 great stone judgment? Well, that's after the second coming. Yeah, it's after, after when Christ... The second coming, mm -hmm, right? The second yeah, coming, so yeah. Those people that pierced him, they won't be there? Yes, yes, they, yes, they will. Well, yes, they will. Yes, they will be there. And then last of all, verse 8 talks about his deity. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And it's interesting that this passage, these verses, begins in verse 4. It talks about grace and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And we talked about the fact that that's God the Father. And now it, in, in verse 8, that same phraseology is used for Jesus Christ, who also is God. 
He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And of course, you know Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. What Jesus Christ is saying is he is all. You can take the beginning of, of any word, the ending of any word. You can take the beginning and ending of alphabet. He is, he's at the beginning, he's at the end, and he's everything in between. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, his deity. This is our Savior, Jesus Christ. How wonderful it is to understand who he is and what he's done. In closing, take your hymnals. Turn to hymn number 210, please. Hymn number 210. I just want you to consider as we close tonight We've talked about all these things about Jesus Christ. All that he's done for us. Indeed, Jesus paid it all. And because of that, all to him we owe. We owe him everything. Are you living for Jesus? Are you serving him? Are you obeying him? Do you look forward to the day when he comes? Are you looking for him? Let's stand together and sing the first verse. I hear my Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Jesus paid it all, number 210. <clears throat> God we serve what a wonderful savior we have all right well let's close in prayer father we thank you so much for your love for us indeed it is such a privilege to be able to call you our heavenly father we thank you for all that our savior did for us lord help us in each day that we live to live for him because indeed he paid it all and all to him we owe. We thank you for what John is showing us here in, in, in this book. And we look forward to what uh, you will show to us in the days ahead. I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand those th these things. May your spirit illuminate us. May your son be honored in all that we say. We look forward to that day when we will be reunited or we will be united with you in glory. What a day that shall be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.